welcome. We're so glad to have all y'all here with us today for our second um, Friday office hours. So, so glad to have y'all here with us. We've had a lot of um, activity in the question portal over the past few weeks, right? Kind of gearing up for the session today. We wanted to hear from you all and see what kind <coughs> of um, uh, seasonal type questions that you had for things that were going on in your landscapes, gardens, um, vegetables, and fruit areas. And so we have kind of organized those questions into kind of pods, if you will, and we're going to kind of address things in sections. So I think just to start things off, we'll just go ahead and get started with um, our, our fruit and tree nut type kind of questions. Um, we had a lot of, uh, of great questions, and I'm also going to say things that we as extension agents get asked a lot, right, especially about uh, the pecan trees, which we were just talking about a second ago. So um, we, I think um, Greg Upchurch and Seth Whitehouse are going to kind of lead our discussion for this section as far as answering the questions, and I'm just going to kind of act as MC. Uh, throughout the, the entire session today, kind of uh, tossing questions back and forth and trying to make sure that we cover as much ground as we can. So let's just go ahead and kick things off. So our first question for you guys this morning is pecan trees. We have someone who says their pecan trees are not producing. Um, their soil test recommended some fertilizer um, and fungal and insecticide spray schedule, but they're they have, I guess they've gotten them on a, a, an insecticide and fungal spray schedule, but they're still not producing. What might be going on, guys? All right. So first I want to say they did a great job starting off with the soil test and have gotten through on the spray schedule. So that's fantastic. Um, but the first thing I saw in that question was it was one uh, pecan tree. So um, that was a kind of a key indication um, why it might not be producing. Um, and that's because all pecan trees require um, pollination, cross-pollination. Um, and so one thing I would, uh, you know, have that homeowner or, you know, uh, producer that really wants pecans on their property um, to look at the variety that they already have. And they can hopefully figure out if it's a type one or type two uh, pollinating uh, pecan tree. And so there's those two types of pecan trees. Uh, one basically releases that pollen before the female flowers are receptive, and then the type two uh, releases the pollen after the female flowers can then be able to receive the pollen. And so um, it's very crucial that a homeowner has at least two pecan trees, one type one, one type two. Um, and so that'll help with actually producing the pecans that were, you know, that's the whole reason we want these pecan trees. So um, definitely look into adding another pecan tree or maybe um, seeing if we can plant one nearby, um, but not crowd them too much close, close together, allow the canopy to spread. Um, and then the second thing I wanted to say, if, you know, I misspoke and maybe they do have multiple pecan trees and that's not an issue of cross-pollination. The second thing I was going to say is, you know, depending on the variety, um, especially like the older varieties of pecan trees, you know, sometimes they can take up to 10 to 15 years before they're starting to even produce anything. Um, so with that, those are two recommendations I would give for them is um, look at the varieties that they have and maybe the age of, of their pecan trees. Greg, did I miss anything on that question? No, nope, you're spot on. And, and Seth, I think it brings up a good point. Any fruit that you're growing, make certain if it's requiring pollination or cross-pollination that those are provided. And some are self-fruiting, some require that cross-pollination. Um, I'm going to, this is still kind of in that same vein of, of pecan type questions. I know that I get asked quite often like about mature pecan trees that may be um, produced heavy one year and then the next year they're really not seeing anything or there's only a few. You want to kind of mention to folks what might be going on there? Like they kind of go through those cycles? Yeah, great. I was just going to real quick say, um, usually that's um, alternate pecan production where you have those on and off years. And that's usually a result of inadequate fertilization. So um, that's one of the biggest things where we need enough uh, nutrients to kind of offset that uh, mature pe pe pecan tree to store enough plant food production um, for the following years. And you know, defoliation in the in the fall could potentially result that more fertilizer is needed. So um, just keep following that soil test recommendation. And, and Greg, do you want to chime in here on anything? 
yeah, a lot of times we can see that in apple production as well. We'll see ebbs and flows. And that's one of the main reasons why commercial orchards will actually thin fruit crops to try and maintain more of a consistent uh, production within those fruit trees. So we really don't have those high ups and swings. So if you're a homeowner and you see your apple tree really produce heavy one year, the next year, there's a pretty good chance that it'll be, there'll be a dip uh, within that production. But also here on the plateau, we run into cases where people wonder why they don't have many apples. And a lot of times it may actually just be uh, frost damage, freeze damage from those late uh, weather events. Yeah, and Greg did mention weather. Sometimes with a wind pollinated crop like pecans, I was smiling when Seth, our Georgia member of the panel said pecans. And so like have some regional differences there, but for pecans, with wind pollination, you can have weather events that might impact the, you know, very wet, rainy weather and things like that. So they're cool, but somewhat complex crop. Cool. So, okay. So we've wrapped things up, I feel like, pretty good on, on pecans. And feel free, folks, if you've got something, uh, you know, a question that's on your mind, pop it in the chat. We're going to have a section at the end where we kind of go through the things that come in Um you know, actively today while we're talking. Um, but the next thing that came through on our question portal um, last week is a question about muscadines. And it's kind of a multi-level question. So I believe um, through their description, they have, um, it says a second year muscadine grapes on single cordons um, and the new leaves have been eaten by bugs, they feel like, but they don't see any bugs. Um, so they sprayed with mancozeb for fun, for fun, like as a fungicide. Um, and they're wondering if they can use the general fruit tree spray, spray that they use for apple trees, which is like a combo product. And if they can do that, <laughs> what are some ways that they can responsibly spray to help protect pollinators? Ooh, lot, that's like a three in one. All right, I'll, uh, I'll start it off and try to break it down as best I can. Um, so first off, they're seeing that the leaves are being eaten. Um, and so, you know, it's very important to know what damage is, is occurring on those leaves. Um, you know, if we're seeing more of a skeletized, you know, you've seen the veins of the leaves left over, you know, I'd maybe say, oh, it's a Japanese beetle or, or maybe a, um, uh, another chewing, you know, insect like a rose shafer kind of beetle that might be chewing through there. Um, but so early in the season, it's, it's probably, you know, flea beetles or, or maybe various uh, leaf hoppers that are kind of, uh, you're seeing some defoliation there. Um, so kind of important to, you know, take pictures of what, you know, that damage looks like. Um, so glad that they're spraying for fungicide as a preventative. And then they asked about general fruit spray um, that they have maybe used on a different crop. Um, the first thing I would say is based on that uh, general, you know, fruit spray, just read the label, make sure it is, you know, labeled for grape or, you know, muscadine production. Um, and the two active ingredients kind of shown there uh, in the ingredient list there um, will hopefully include either or both uh, malathine or a carbaryl uh, percentage in there. And so that those two uh, insecticides are very important to control all those insects that I kind of mentioned from flea beetles to Japanese beetles to, um, you know, rose shaper, great berry moth, uh, list goes on, other various leaf hoppers. Um, and so I would make sure that that contains those active ingredients of malathion and carbaryl. So yes to that, uh, you know, fruit tree spray. Um, and then they also wanted to avoid harming pollinators. So when should I spray? Um, and generally, you know, if your schedule allows, uh, any time where pollinators are not actively foraging is generally going to be in the dawn or dusk period. So um, if you can kind of get your mind wrapping around um, thinking of when the pollinators are actively foraging and spraying when they are not actively foraging, um, when the sun is at its peak there. Um, and so, you know, I'll, I'll go on the, the last part of that question and maybe Greg can kind of take over here. They're seeing tiny clusters of beads that they're assuming are, are flower buds or the start of the grapes there. Um, I'm not certain, maybe that could be uh, shriveled up uh, grapes that might they might be seeing. Greg, what did you think about that, that part of that question? I don't know that I saw the back portion okay. of that question, but uh, that's certainly a possibility. 
uh, the one thing that Seth said there, read the label. The second thing, follow the label. Uh, a lot of times people, they may look at some of those and I, I like the all-in-one fruit tree spray uh, um, products, but I have seen homeowners, particularly in apple trees, abuse those from the standpoint that they over applied them. Uh, most of those contain carboreal for like apples. Uh, we use uh, carboreal as a thinning agent in commercial orchards. And so we can see a lot of fruit drop just because the homeowner oversprayed a product that while uh, labeled and listed for it uh, can cause uh, some fruit drop on those. So read the label to see if it's labeled for it and to follow that label. I would tell you, go to uh, our UT Extension publication, I believe that's 1622. Uh, uh, Dr. Bumgarner, Dr. Hansen, Dr. Lockwood, I think Dr. Vale have all gone in and, and done some edits on it and re-released that. That is a great publication and there's some tremendous information in there. And again, none of us, Dr. Bumgarner or, or myself, we, we cannot, tell you to use something that's off label and that labels a law. So uh, that product, follow our guide there for those uh, spray programs. And once you get that product, check and make certain that you read the label and that that product is labeled for what your, your intending spray is. And how many sprays. That was one of the things that we really dug into when we revised that publication because some of those multi-function products there may be different limits for different products, you know, through the season, like the insecticide or the fungicide. So, you know, it's really important to know how many times you've used those multi-use products because some of that can, can vary. Yeah, and sometimes, I mean, I've even seen on labels where they'll tell you, you can use it once or twice, and then you need to rotate out to a different chemistry. So the, all those are things that can be included in that label. And if you read, those are the things to improve the efficacy of what you're trying to use. So read and follow the label. Good, good thorough coverage on that question. Thanks, y'all. <laughs> and I, before we move on to another section, I really want uh, to do at least one more question here from the fruit, um, from the fruit section. It is about peaches. So we have someone who sent in a question. It says they think something's getting into their um, peaches on their peach tree, obviously. <laughs> they um, All the peaches started to shrivel up and then they fell off. And when they uh, looked into that fruit, they could see that they had small little bugs inside of them that were kind of like little bitty caterpillars that were kind of like light cream colored. My first thought there, Greg, was just, um, I'm thinking that pest might be a secondary, um, you know, following up as to what the real issue is. Um, and, you know, peaches and those stone fruits are notorious for brown rot. Um, and, you know, you can see those uh, fruiting of the, of the peaches kind of shriveling up like that. Um, and then maybe the insect is coming in after the fact is what I was maybe thinking from this question. Uh, so my first thought here was, you know, do they have the fungicide uh, spray plan kind of like we talked about from that same publication, 1622 there in the link. Um, to prevent that uh, brown rot from occurring. And usually the product Captan uh, does a great job at, at controlling that and preventing it. And then secondary issues there with the, with the pest, um, you know, hard to identify uh, just based on the, the larva, but, you know, plum curculio gets in there, oriental fruit moth um, could be another one. Um, and, you know, when they're in there, an insecticide control is not going to work. Uh, because they're protected by the peach that they're inside. Um, so, you know, not always the best to, to manage when they're already in there, but um, spraying for the, the adult stage there. Greg, do you want to say anything on that? Yeah, I, I would just say that probably of all of our fruits, the peaches are probably going to be our most challenging uh, crop to grow in this part of the world. Uh, rain, humidity, temperatures, uh, you name it. There's a lot of, there's a, there's a reason why Tennessee is not known as the peach state. And so I would tell you to get on that spray control program and monitor, look at fungal diseases first because our wetness is really, really, really gonna drive those fungal diseases. Uh, sanitation, getting rid of mummified fruit, uh, mummified fruit on the ground, cleaning that up because 
like with brown rot, once it's in uh, that area, and particularly during wet years, uh, a lot of our spray programs may try and keep it at bay, but they're not going to stop it. And so sanitation is going to be really, really critical from a, um, a fruit peach. And I would tell you to really follow that spray schedule. So last one last thing I, I wanted to mention, there was one question in there about uh, raspberries, red uh, raspberries. I would tell homeowners, uh, if you're going to grow raspberries, I would uh, focus on the red raspberries in our state, a little bit more cold hardiness. Dr. Lockwood has got a phenomenal uh, publication on pruning cane berries. That would be all blackberries as well as uh, the raspberries. That first year of those, uh, if you've set them out and you've got that small uh, plant, which was a one year old transplant, I would tell you to go back and cut back to two buds, let those new canes come out and you're gonna grow those. Uh, pruning and management of those will be a little bit different from the cane berries, uh, blackberries to the, the raspberries. I know typically back blackberries are gonna be a little bit more vigorous and grow uh, for you while the red and yellow raspberries are probably gonna be the least vigorous. With our uh, blackberries, we're typically going to let those grow up to approximately five feet or whatever your trellis system is. And if you were looking at that first year of growth, make certain that you have a trellis system in. Uh, put your good trellis system in to kind of keep those uh, raspberries and or blackberries up off the ground. But we're gonna tip those out. When that soft tip gets to about uh, five feet approximately or just above our trellis, we're gonna pinch the tops that little uh, green tip out to make it start forcing those lateral branches. Now that's not the case when we start looking at red and yellow raspberries where basically they're not as vigorous, they're gonna be a little slower growing. So we're gonna let those grow on out up to uh, the top of our trellis. Awesome, thanks y'all for um, answering those questions for us. I feel like we've really touched on a lot of the right things that are going on right now um, as far as uh, fruits and nuts go, things that people are noticing um, and having issues with. So again, that's why we're hosting these um, Friday office hours. We just want to um, hear from y'all and um, help provide some solutions. To some <laughs>